It's 1966, and Torsten Holman, the world champion, comes to America to show us how you really go fast, and he's on a two-stroke. And I was fortunate enough to be there to be a part of the beginning of motocross from Carlsbad Raceway to Castec, California, Forest Ranch, Bay Mare, Mammoth Mountain, Westlake Village, Encinitas, Saddleback Park, Hangtown, where the motocross nationals are held today. But let's not forget Hopetown, where Torsten Holman raced his first race, or I should say, put on an exhibition. But wait a minute, let's go back to the very beginning before motocross was even around. Gary, uh, I guess the first question I throw at everybody is, at what age uh, did you get interested in motorcycles and what sparked that interest? Do you remember? Uh, sure do. I remember it very well. Uh, at the age of 13, uh, my grandfather had had a motorcycle shop ever since he was, well, he'd been riding motorcycles ever since he was 16 years old himself, the old Indians and Harleys. And he was still had the motorcycle shop, and my brother was doing a little bit of racing out in the desert, and obviously I kind of got the idea that I wanted to do it too. Okay, we say desert, so we're, are we talking uh, California? We're talking California, Southern California, out in the desert, uh, hair scrambles, hair and hounds. All the, all the high speed stuff that these guys, of course, it was high speed then, today it's really high speed. <laughs> I first went racing uh, when I was 13 years old. Uh, that was about uh, 1957. And um, had a 1955 Triumph Cub uh, suspension, a little short on that. Uh, plungers on the rear shock and a couple of things, fork tubes with some oil in it, a couple springs. Uh, and that's what I started out on. The scrambles or the desert uh, racing? That was in desert racing. I uh, rode that for a while uh, and then uh, started doing some scrambles racing as well as the, the cross country. So. D didn't you try your hand at dirt tracking for a while? Uh, I did a little bit of flat tracking. I uh, rode quite a bit of short track uh, in uh, 65, uh, 66, 67, 68. Did a little bit, mostly on short tracks. Uh, did a little bit of flat tracking in 65 and 66 at uh, Ascot Park on the half mile. Uh, it was just, uh, wasn't my cup of tea. I wanted more riding. Uh, you didn't get enough riding out there. And um, I don't know, I never liked that wall out there. It just seemed like it was always a little too close when you come flying on that straightaway at 90 to 95 mile an hour. I said, yeah. And then there was indoor short track. Man, was that a lot of fun. Trying to figure out how to get traction on that stuff was definitely interesting. But Long Beach, California arena, good. Sometimes it didn't work out too well, but a lot of fun. Then there was that short track racing at Southgate. Always loved that. Thursday nights, 20 minutes from the house, a lot of fun. And then there was Ascot Park. Got to ride a lot of different bikes there. 500cc matchless single. Yeah, that thing was pretty heavy. And then a 600 matchless twin. Yeah, and those things didn't have much suspension, as you can probably see. Man, I got to ride a lot of motorcycles back then. Here's me on a 650 Triumph. A lot of horsepower there. Again, not much suspension. I don't know why people always want to fall in front of me. From a 600 matchless twin to a 100cc Hodaka riding a flat track. But winning was always fun. Hey, you know what? Try this today and see how it works out. Yeah, love Thursday nights. Well, let's get back to that interview now. At that age, had you heard the word, or were you aware of the European motocross? Did that ever enter your... Uh, you know, I always liked scrambles. That was my main thing, which is actually what motocross is. In scrambles, when I started out riding scrambles, it was just natural terrain, and, you know, that's, it, was, it was motocross, basically. I didn't just a little different format. It was heat semis main events instead of having two motos. And, uh, and when I had first heard uh, about motocross, about early 65, and I heard the name Torsten Holman, and, uh, and, and they had a couple of motocross races, um, I didn't really know what it was, but I went there, I heard it was an old scrambles, basically. So I went there and it was natural terrain. And uh, from there, I just went, even though I was still riding some short tracks and things like that, I, I basically started spending most of my time geared toward motocross. 
did you, had, did you, had you gone over to Europe actually to see it? Or uh, no, to, no, to I it? just, uh, when they come over here. Edison and, Dye, uh, Edison Dye uh, sent uh, Torsten Holmer over here first, then he sent a couple other Husky riders over, and then um, I believe it was in late 68 or 69, actually 68, uh, that they brought over the CZ riders. They, they brought Joel and Roger and, and um, a couple other guys in CZs, plus uh, Holman and, uh, and a few of the other, uh, Arnie Kring. Uh, a few of those guys over, and when I saw them go, I just went, man, because I mean, we thought we were pretty good. And these guys, I mean, they'd laugh us, and I was just going, cool, we got some work to do. While riding motocross on the weekends, I was still doing that Thursday night short track TT racing so that I could get lots of time on two wheels and learn a lot more. There was a lot of good times there running Westlake Village where they shot some of the movie scenes for the westerns. At this particular time, there was the American Cycle Association where I was fortunate enough to be the champion in the 125cc and the 500cc class. And I always liked to have fun. Boy, when I showed up with the rabbit ears, they were all laughing, but I got a lot of attention for that one. Motocross the way it was back in the day. They didn't prep everything. If there was a water hole, you either went through it or you went around it. Yeah, in the late 60s, brother Bob and I, we got to promote one of the first stadium races in Ascot Park. Well, brother Bob, he did most of the work and that's because I was still racing and trying to keep on top of my game there and doing a lot of traveling. So it was a little difficult for me to help much with that part of it. Then there was Mammoth Mountain. Man, what a great place. The track, crazy. They didn't even hardly clean up anything, no plowing, just moved a few rocks, got them out of the way, said, hey guys, here you are, and have fun. Yep, I was riding a 380 Greaves, a 250 Greaves, and a 125 Penton at this time. Then there was the trip to Seattle. Yep, four of us, six motorcycles, and a 12-hour drive. How much fun is that? Then there was the first race at Hangtown. Yep, I won the 500cc class. Then it's Saddleback Park. Wow, did we have a lot of racing going on there during the 60s. Yep, me and my 250 degrees. Boy, did we spend a lot of time at Saddleback and did we have some good times there. How about July 4th, 1969? I got the opportunity to run against some of the top Europeans that were running in the World Championships at the time and ended up winning the overall in the Firecracker Grand Prix on July 4th, 1969. Yep, I got a third in the first moto and I won the last one, but it was a little different in Grand Prix racing. It wasn't just about who finished highest in the last moto. Both motos were timed, so we had to wait till the final to see the times. And man, was it close. I just squeaked in on that one, and I had no idea that times were involved. So what did I get for that? Yep, $150 for winning the overall. Crazy, that's what the Europeans got paid just for showing up. Oh well, gas was only 25 cents a gallon, so... I guess that was a pretty good amount of money. Check out the boots and the pants. These are the ones that I actually wore that day. Man, things were tough back then. Oh, and that's my 380 Greaves. What a sweet motorcycle that was. When that came out, I was definitely excited. Not only was I excited and loved the motorcycle, but I won a lot of races on that baby. That was a good time in my days. Carlsbad Raceway, all over Southern California. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I won two trips that year. One to England and another one to Germany to go over and compete, not only against some of the European riders in an international and local races, but also I got the opportunity to go over and see the Greaves factory and meet Mr. Greaves. And I even got my own shirt made by Greaves with my picture on it. Man, life was good. Then the day before my birthday, I got to race a local event and won five of the six races that I entered and got second in the other one. 
In 1969, Gary Bailey was in the right place at the right time, and another motorcycling legend, John Penton, opened the door to a new career. The first school I'd ever done was, um, was at um, Lorraine, Ohio, uh, when Tentons were promoting the event there, uh, the, the Trans Am event. And a couple of the Europeans were supposed to do a motocross school. Uh, they decided that afternoon before that they didn't want to do it, so I was... Uh, Mr. Penton come to me and said, hey, can you do a motocross school? I got 20 some guys coming in the morning. I go, I don't know anything about a motocross school. You know, he said, well, do something because these guys are going to be here and they're ready for a school. I said, well, all right, I'll give it a shot. So um, what I did is I got the guys there in the morning, explained the situation to them, said, hey, I'm your teacher. Um, I'm going to straight out ride. I don't know what I'm doing. I said, I know how to ride. Obviously, I'm one of the top American riders. I know you know what I do, I can explain that to you, I can talk you through it, you can, you can t ask me questions, I'll give you answers. I said, well, just wing it. I, I don't know what to do. So we went around, spent the whole day, um, every, got done at the end of the day, everybody was just ecstatic, just going, man, this was great. Man, I really, I'm glad you did that. March of 1970, uh, I started traveling around the country, uh, left California, um, um, left everything there except for my van, my trailer and motorcycles, got rid of my house, got rid of everything and just Went on the road and started teaching schools, had no clue. Uh, quit my job that I was doing and said, you know what, I want to be a motorcycle racer and uh, I want to try and teach schools and I'm going to see how it goes. So it was on the road with my van, a 125 Sax motorcycle, a 250 Greaves and a 380 Greaves to go out and teach motocross schools and race traveling across the United States in hopes that I could make a living doing something that I love. At that point, Gary, uh, had your association with the Boltacos started? Um, I actually started riding Boltacos um, in 1971 here at Daytona. I'd been riding Greaves uh, until that time. I was riding Greaves and uh, a little bit of Hodakas and actually riding Pittons as well. And, um, and I had a Greaves ride. I was signed up here ready to ride at Daytona, the first course that we built here at Daytona. And uh, the week before, the importer of Boltaco into the States had contacted me about riding Boltacos. And I said, well, I don't know. And we were in negotiations between money and, and uh, until the night before the event, this was on Friday night, I had not yet signed a, a contract. Uh, at about 10 o'clock the night before the first Supercross here, I signed a contract with Bull Taco, went out there for practice that morning. They went down to the show to the armory, pulled the bike that they had on the show, worked on it all night long, brought it out there. The president of Bull Taco was here, John Grace, working on my motorcycle as a mechanic, just coming with his shirt and tie and everything on, took his tie off, took his jacket off, threw it over there, white shirt, down there working on the bike. Um, when I went out for practice, I had never been on the motorcycle before in my life. Did you, did you build that track? Yes. Was that one of your tracks? So you built from the very beginning, 71 very we're talking about. Yes. 1997, I see you out there yeah. this week building a track. Yeah. You're talking 26 years then, That's right? correct. 27. 27, 27 rather. Yeah. Amazing. How did you do in that first Supercross? Um, Daytona Supercross. I believe I won my heat race, but I got third in the final. Uh, 1972, I won two AMA Nationals. Uh, let's put it this way. I competed in two AMA Nationals, entered, competed in two, and won both of them. Super. Um, one was at the Super Speedway over Talladega, right? Uh, one was at Talladega. Uh, the other one was at uh, Washington, Indiana. And the only reason I didn't ride more of them is because my schedule was already kind of set. Uh, a few of the nationals had already gone by. I hadn't even contemplated riding them. Uh, people asked me to do schools there, so I thought, hey, while I'm there, I might as well ride the national too, you know? Uh, and Talladega had asked me to build the, the track there, so I thought, of course, well, you know, while I'm here, I might as well you know, ride the thing. There ain't no sense in not riding it. Uh, so I rode both of them, won both of them, and I thought, geez, you know, that might have been the year I should have <laughs> should have rode all of them. I might have, I might have got me a championship out of that. So, when did in your mind you say, hey, the schools have become more important than racing? Actually, uh, in about 72, 73, it started or something right around 72. Uh, that's why I didn't ride all the national series. I hadn't planned on it. Who hung the tag professor on you? Or where, where did that ever come from? Uh, that came from um, Don Woods did an article uh, when I was in Shreveport, Louisiana, titled it Professor Bailey's Cure for the European Invasion. You have a son, David Bailey, became one of the great, great racers in motocross. Tell us how that began and what a, what, how proud you must have been to see David progress. And I know he helped at your schools at a young age. 
You know, I, I, am, I am a believer that anybody that has a natural athletic talent, okay? Uh, you can't make anyone a champion. But if they have a natural athletic ability, I think you can make them a champion. But it takes a lot of time, a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication. Not only on the part of the person that's helping them, but on the person themselves that is, that is going to do that. Which is one thing that David had. Some of it I think that I instilled in him, and some of it, it was just something that he had. He knew responsibility, he knew what it takes, and when he decided he was going to do something, it was going to happen. After Gary's son David won three national championships, a Supercross title, and was a member of five World Championship Motocross the Nations teams, he suffered paralyzing injuries. You know, it was a tough time, real tough time for him, obviously. Uh, many people always said, yeah, I know what you're feeling. David's comment was, no, you don't. And, I mean, you could understand that so much. Nobody ever knows until you're in that situation nobody can unless you've been in that situation nobody knows i've been there with him but i can't fathom it you always seem to have a smile on your face you seem to be appreciative of what life is period um i am i'm very fortunate and i realize it but people say it all the time so it really keeps it here there's very few people in this world to get to do what they love doing and make a living in it and what I love more than anything, I want to love riding motorcycles. And I love teaching. Okay, so let's take a look back at the motorcycles from the past. Yep, this was my first bike, a 1955 Triumph Club. If you look closely, you'll notice that there is no suspension. It's a rigid frame, not a nice ride. And yes, there were no race bikes back then you had to modify and make it a race bike pretty good form there huh well my next bike was a 59 200 cc triumph cub good news now we had suspension well i'm not so sure about that but at least it wasn't the rigid frame and now we get to the 650 triumph 350 some pounds Lots of horsepower with very little suspension. I'm sure you can imagine how the landing was on this baby. Well, those were all four strokes. And now for the two strokes. Yep, they started out small. You had to ride a little trail bike, which was a Yamaha 80. And once again, that had to be converted to a race bike. Surprisingly, we got some pretty good power out of those little bikes with some aftermarket help. And can you imagine six foot five on this little rascal? Yep, but I sure had a lot of fun. And then came the Hodaka Ace 90, which eventually became a 100, which was the first small bike with a real motorcycle frame. I had a lot of success on that bike, went in some desert races, several TT and short track races, but man, that bike was a lot of fun to ride. Yep, I was big on it, but I could definitely make things happen. While I was having pretty good success on my 100cc Hodaka, I get a call from Greaves, and Nick Nicholson asked me if I'd be interested in riding his bikes. Well, of course, the answer was yes, so I rode the Springer front-end Greaves and even made a Cycle News cover. And because I was riding a lot of short track and TT racing, Greaves made a few of these special little TT250 Greaves. That was definitely the answer for those short track and TT races. Next come the 250 Greaves Griffin. Man, was that a neat bike. And with this bike, I would have a lot of success all over California, up into Washington State and over to Colorado. And without a doubt, one of my biggest accomplishments was racing against some of the European World Champions July 4th, 1969, and another Cycle News cover. At the same time, there was this 380 Greaves Griffin. Well, that was a nice bike as well. Bottom line, I just like racing. Back then, it was three 20-minute motos each class, and I always rode two, and if I could, 
I would ride three classes in the same day. Next, switching from the Hodaka to the 125 Penton. More power, bigger frame. I was a lot more comfortable on this little bike. And I liked it so much that when I heard they were making a 100, guess what? What's the possibility of getting one of those and I can ride the 100, the 125, the 250, and the open class? Or mix it up a little on any given day. Well, when I decided to go on the road and start teaching and racing, Benton wasn't too excited about that because they wanted me to win in Southern California. And so I was offered a ride from Saks while riding my 250 and 380 Greaves. Then came the offer from Bull Taco that would last 10 years. Yeah, a lot of great things happened in those 10 years from the debut at Daytona, riding my new Bull Taco. Things got a bit easier then. I was able to travel the country and race my Bull Tacos and have an opportunity to teach schools to a lot of people around the country. I even come up with an idea about building what today is called a toy hauler. So I built this trailer with living quarters in the front and motorcycles stored in the back. Boy, was that a big change from living in that van for so long. This trailer had everything, and it was just like being at home and having your own garage. Yeah, things were pretty good back then. Heck, I even got an invite from Mr. Bulto to head over to Spain to check out the factory. By the way, the factory. When I got over there at the time, they had just improved the factory. When I say improved, they just put in some concrete floors. Till that time, floors had all been dirt. Seeing the bikes being put together was pretty cool, but was even cooler was Mr. Bulto invited all the factory riders over for a weekend at his farm riding trials. Pretty cool, but get there, all the bikes are lined up with their names on them, so there was no question which one you were going to ride. Yep, that was a good time for sure, but getting back to the States and teaching motocross, helping a lot of riders to be safer and better riders. You know, it's funny, until I started teaching motocross, I really didn't have any idea how little I actually knew about what I was doing and what I needed to do. So, thinking about that and doing a lot of studying and a lot of research, I decided to put together a motocross book, How to Win Motocross. Here's one very few people will know anything about, the old hand on helmet start. Yep, you had to keep your hand on your helmet until the guy dropped the flag. First trick, get as low to the bike as you can with your head close to the handlebar so you're ready to grab that clutch whenever the guy drops the flag. Yeah, we did things a little different back in the day. Of course, the motorcycles were completely different too. Yeah, it was still keep the weight over the front end of the bike, but was interesting about those old bikes, the front of the seat was actually behind the foot peg. Yep, there was always and still the importance of bike setup, lever adjust, the proper amount of free play in the lever, and keeping your weight over the front end of the bike to have more control over the front end. It was always good to have David do a little demonstration so people could see how he was doing and compared to what I was doing. And as soon as I put this 10, 11 year old kid out there and they saw him executing it, they were like, for sure, oh, I can do that. And of course, I always had to do a little bit of showboating in that old famous cross-up we used to do. Not sure what it did, but it sure looked cool. Even while teaching my schools, I was always looking for a way to do it better and go faster. And no matter the weather, we don't stop. You race in the rain, you train in the rain. Nothing better than me and David getting a chance to go out and ride a little. Man, it was always good to see how many riders really wanted to learn how to be safer and better riders. I was always serious about my motocross schools. We'd start early and we'd run late, sometimes until it was so dark you couldn't even hardly see. It was important for me to see if it was a one-day class or a two-day class that these riders got as much as they could possibly get out of it. The days were long, but my riders, they never got shortchanged. 
Sometimes David or myself would demonstrate the section. On occasion, I would get two or three riders to start in front of me at the beginning of a section. Then I would show how to run them down and make the pass. Part of it was just better line selection. At some time during the day, there's always time for a little play. Boy, do I remember this hill, and was it a lot of fun. You know, I always said it was fun to ride with Dave. Well, we carried a couple of Alpinas with us, which were kind of a cross between a trail bike and a trials bike. We could always have time to work on our skills to improve our balance and clutch control and work on some wheelies and whatever we needed to do to make ourselves better riders. You know, anytime we stopped, I always encourage riders, if you have a question, don't hesitate to ask, whether it's during the class or after. Questions, questions, questions. Never hesitate to ask. It's the only way you learn. Oh, yeah, the old, oh, I broke my leg. Interesting. Never broke a bone racing except for in my hand once. Broke my leg three times teaching schools. But I wasn't going to let that stop me, so I built a rig with a sidecar on it so that I could still keep going. On one occasion, I actually got me one of those three-wheelers. I don't know exactly what it was called, but that allowed me to get around to keep an eye on my students while David, he got to be the demonstrator. And I think that helped him a lot because he learned how to ride under pressure. Demonstrating was always fun. It allowed me to push my bull tacos to the limit. And also give all my students the opportunity to be able to see the things that I had just described and told them that what I was going to do. Plus, when I stopped, there were always a lot of questions about what they just saw. Always good to ride with David. Give me a chance to push him a little. Well, I was still faster than him. Another thing that was always fun, somebody would say, yeah, you're on a 250. So I'd grab their 80 or they're 65 and go through the section. And they were kind of like, uh, okay, I guess my bike can do that. Yeah, doing the schools from the very beginning was a lot of fun. Just helping riders and seeing them improve. And at the end, everybody got to take home a certificate. Next was 1972. I was contacted by a show called American Sportsman where they would pick a celebrity to participate in some sport they had never done for an entire week and then participate at the end of that week. Well, my guy was Bill Russell. He was the Michael Jordan back in the day. Great week, lots of laughs. If you want to see that full show, it's on my YouTube channel. Check it out. And that same year, I was invited to go down to Lima, Peru to teach a motocross school. Man, was that a lot of fun. And not only the school, but we got to do a trail ride up in the hills, which was absolutely amazing. Kind of dry out there, but plenty of big hills, deep sand, really challenging. Yeah, David and I shipped our bikes down there so that we had some really good bikes to ride because their bikes were a little questionable. And then there was Rick Simon from Dirt Bike Magazine who got to go along with Chuck and Sharon Clayton from Cycle News. The track, well, it was a little sketchy in places, but a lot of fun. Come off the top of this mountain with the longest downhill with the narrowest track coming down you've ever seen. During the school, there was always the usual demonstration. When it come to actually talking to the guys, most of them didn't speak English or understand it much, so I had to have my translator there to help me with that part of it. Then it was back to the States to do the normal thing, teaching motocross schools and racing. Well, here was a good one. We're at a motocross track, which is actually right next to the Mississippi River. So it starts raining hard and everybody's going, hey, the water's rising, so you better get out. Look over the ridge right there. You can see the top of the boat going down the Mississippi River. It keeps raining and raining, and needless to say, I was a little scared, and maybe my rigs were scared too. 
We couldn't get out of there. We had to get a dozer to come to pull us out over the top. Man, was that sketchy. Oh, and then there's always some other exciting things where you're trying to make a turn with a big rig and next thing you know, the vehicle slides a little bit and into a tree and it's hot and humid and miserable. But we said, well, how do we get out of here? Let's just cut the daggum tree down. That should solve that problem. Well, this would be a good time to talk about through all this racing years. I started out with a 62 Ford Ranchero. I then got me a Ford van so that I could stay inside of it when I was at the racetrack. Put a little bed and things in there. Then I built my custom hauler. My next rig was a 28-foot Winnebago with a 28-foot garage I had custom made to pull along behind. And of course I had to make room in there to carry the air hockey table for when there was no racing going on. Then when I started my Botaco dealership, we downsized a little bit to a box van because we weren't living on the road all the time. Then there was a Class C motorhome pulling a little treader behind. Then it would be the High Point fiberglass trailers. Yeah, I started out with a 16-footer, realized that wasn't enough space for what I wanted to do, so I expanded to a 28. Then when I signed a deal with Honda, I had a custom 40-foot rig made that had everything you could ever want. Yeah, this was a big one. Not only did it have a concessionary in the back for selling my shirts and stuff, I also had a video room up in the front so that I could do editing while I was gone. Eventually, we went to bigger graphics and eventually a bigger truck, small freight liner. Man, this rig was perfect. I'd go to all the amateur national events and set up a display for Honda. Yep, then I got rid of the big rig, got rid of the freight liner, so I didn't have to drive that around all the time. Huh, but this is what you saw going down the road with the graphics kit that I designed and put on the back end. Had to be pretty funny coming up on this. Then at last it came down to this. Same size, much better layout, better living, love it. Yep, travel, travel, travel. Byron, Illinois, from there we head on down to Tallahassee, Florida. Yep, and then Daytona to lay out another track. North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, Tennessee. I liked racing. Again, I would ride two classes, three classes, whatever I could ride. All I wanted to do was still race my motorcycle and have the opportunity to teach a motocross school to help all the local guys learn to go faster and to be a safer rider. Yeah, that's me styling again, always trying to show off a little, whether it's a motocross school or it's a race. You always got to look stylish. It's back to Daytona again for another lay out the track and race. Man, look at the stands and how different they are from today. There was a lot of things back then that made them the good old days. Back in the day, we actually started 40 bikes wide on the same start going down to a very close first turn. At number 93, that's me. I always started on the far outside because I didn't want to be involved in any of that mayhem going into the first turn. Short start, 40 bikes, you know what you're going to get most of the time going into that turn. That's back when it got really rough, and this was the real Daytona race that separated it from all the others. The track back then, it was a lot rougher. We didn't haul in any dirt to make the track. We rode on the grass that was there, brought in just enough dirt to build some jumps and dug some pits and made some whoop de doos just to make that sucker as rough as I possibly could. The circuit at Daytona is unique. It always gets a lot of attention. Gary Bailey was a pioneer of this sport, rode in the first Daytona Supercross. That was uh, relatively late in his career, and it wasn't called Supercross back then. He retired, he started a motocross school, and he began making the lives of the competitors miserable by designing the Daytona course. He's done it now for 30-odd years, and we spent a few minutes uh, talking to the professor about the challenge of building the track and the challenge it presents to the riders. 
The guys that win here are the tough ones. They're the guys that are physically fit, and it's pretty much been through, I mean, hey, we got Ricky Carmichael, who's pretty much dominated this thing here pretty well, and, and, uh, and Jeff Stanton, who dominated here. And if I had more to say about exactly how it was built, I would actually build it a little tougher and throw in a couple of obstacles. I remember the old days when, if there was a sheer wall there, nobody complained about it, nobody whined, nobody, you know, today everybody's like, well, it's not just like the other ones and it's not perfect and it's but I don't know I never know that everything had to be exactly perfect you know I mean if it's different and it's a ch more of a challenge to as long as it's safe uh, that's my thing I want to build it as tough as possible but as safe as possible to ensure that the Daytona Supercross will be unlike any other on the circuit that makes the track and its builder an easy target for the critics I decided to soften it up, and I heard more complaining that one year that I softened it up from the, the riders going, what's the matter, Bailey? You're getting soft in your old age, and da 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 And I thought, well, you know what? That's the last time I think I'm ever going to hear that, so I'm going to make sure that I try and keep it just as rough as possible. So They seem to always complain at first when they first get here, and they're walking the track, and they complain about it. At the end of the day, most people are going, hey, you know what? The track came out pretty good. It was it's actually pretty nice. I kind of liked it. You know, and, and you know, the interesting thing was when, when my son David was racing, uh, every year he'd get here, he hated the racetrack. He'd always go, Dad, do you want to change this? And I go, I'm building the racetrack, you're racing, shut up. Long, rough, and sandy, the Daytona layout is a unique challenge on the Supercross circuit, and Bailey puts the emphasis on challenge. I like to try and build things a little bit different than are the others, all the other Supercrosses, just for the fact that I want to see how the guys handle those situations differently. So, and, and I always want to try and keep it Daytona. I don't ever want to try and get it exactly like the other Supercrosses, if it's all possible. My sand whoops are definitely the personalized thing, and I usually build at least two sections of them, sometimes three, and trying to make them a little bit of a variety. For Bailey, this is all sort of personal. He raced Daytona the first four years it ran. A decade later, in 1984, he watched his son David win the big race. Last year, he presided over the first night race in Daytona Supercross history. And tonight, as this American classic celebrates another anniversary, we say thanks to the professor, Gary Bailey, for 35 years of great memories. What's going to happen when I'm not building anymore at Daytona? I, I, you know, I don't really know. Uh, I, it'll probably change when I'm not building it because somebody's going to come in with a whole new, different idea of how you build things and, and uh, you know, how the layout is. Um, I, I just have no idea. It's, it's an interesting thought, but I know one thing. Me and my, my buddy Don Flaner that helps me build the track, we decided that the first year that I'm not building the Daytona track, we're coming to Daytona and we're going to be the full-on spectators. We're going to just come out and just have a great time and just bring our street bikes down here and really enjoy what Bike Week is really all about. On those bull tacos back in the day or on the bulldozer these days, that guy has made some huge contributions to this sport, and we are abundantly blessed with Bailey's, aren't we? We have that one who built the track, and we have his son, David, up in the booth. What do you think, guys? Uh, what kind of job has he done this year? Oh, I love it. You know, and, and as, like he said, it, it's so true, and it's funny that I, I love hearing him say, shut up, because I, I totally remember that. And actually, that was the year that I won. But uh, typically, like he said, you walk the track, and you're like, yeah, it could be a little wider here. This could have been different. This year is the best track that I've ever seen. And I also had the opportunity to lay out the Houston Astrodome the first couple of years along with the first Dallas Supercross race. Yep, I got to lay it out and I got to participate and had some pretty good runs back in the day. Then after talking with Bull Taco, I said, hey, I got an idea. Rather than me just going out there and doing that, how about I put a team together so now it was me and David and Bob Harris and Gary Chaplin. Man, we had the bikes, 125, 250s, 370s. We were ready to show them how it was done on a bull taco. Oh yeah, and in the beginning, I took David's Yamaha 80 and I made it look like one of our bull tacos until he got a chance to start riding the 125. Yeah, building the tracks was always fun. David even got a chance to try one of the jumps on his bicycle and work on his cross-up. Well, that's me and Bill Franz Jr. talking about the track. Now, Talladega was a little different than Daytona. Not any sand there, all hard-packed clay, and not much grass either, so uh, it was definitely like being out in some kind of a field going racing. 
It was always fun being at the big races. All the guys were there. That's me, Brad Lackey, and Jim Pomeroy. When the air hockey table come out, that's me and Mike Runyard. And then there's Mark Blackwell, and you got Pomeroy playing somebody. And then there's me and the helmet cam. Ha! <laughs> Tell you what, was that baby heavy, particularly if you come off a jump. And be sure to notice the counterbalance on the other side. Man, this was definitely not the GoPro version. I would definitely call this the Oh No version. Me, Bull Taco, and Goodyear. That was definitely a winning combination back in the day. Not only was the Goodyear deal sweet, I got to test a lot of tires. You know, back in those early 70s, I got to do a lot of racing. From the East Coast to the West Coast, from the North to the South. 125, 250, and 370. Sometimes on the same day, I rode them all. Even after a good rain, we still had to race. But you know what? My bull taco almost never failed me. Yep, you heard that right. I said almost. Here's the ad. October 24th, 1971, Gary Bailey's bull taco failed to finish. But that was the one and only time in the last 64 starts in the last season. In there was a combination of 43 first places, 11 seconds, and nine other top six placings. For a couple of years there, I had a few different riders riding for me, and we definitely had bike. Yep, my first two guys decided to go off and do their own thing. So then I gave Bob Norris the opportunity to travel with us and to work with the schools and race as many classes as we could race and try to dominate the competition and show them that those bull tacos are what they should be riding if they want to win. I'm sure that all the different tracks that we went to and David raced at him as well. It gave him an opportunity each week to ride against different riders on different tracks. So it gave him a better feel for what he was going to be in for whenever he turned pro. He even got to ride the track that I made at Atlanta Motor Speedway, which was pretty cool. That was a one-off race there. Living in the RV, traveling the country, Riding my dirt bikes. How could life be any better than this? Lucky? Huh, I was blessed. Yeah, then there was David and, well, Mitchell come along. 75, we had some really good bikes. That's my 370 right there. Well, I did something a little different. I built David a 100 bull taco. This was kind of unique. I took the 125 purse thing, got a 100 cylinder, put it on top of that baby and he got to race two classes. Now here's something unique that most people have never seen. It's a dual swing arm. I can't describe to you exactly how it works, but it made it more of a progressive feel, similar to the long travel suspension, which you were allowed to get more travel out of it that way. Heck, Mr. Bolto come over from Spain and one of their Spanish riders was over here to help test this stuff. For me, the strangest feel was that it actually made traction. Hey, how about my balancing act that with the trials bike that I had in the Alpina, which was close to a trials bike. So I would pull up, stop the bike, change to the other side of the bike, climb on the other side. Then eventually I'd work my way from there and I would get myself up onto the front wheel so that I could stand on the front wheel with no hands. Little tough, but a lot of fun. Hey, one time, David got on there with me and we did the thing together. Pretty much everywhere we went, if they knew about this balancing act, they would ask me to perform it. If they didn't, I'd figure out a way just to go out there and do it without them asking. Once I'd completed this, it was climb back around, get on the motorcycle, start it, and ride off. And well, as you would expect, as Mitchell got a little older, he showed some interest in, in riding. And the first bike he had was a little Italijet. From there, we got him a 60 Yamaha to start practicing on. And he started working on his form and 
getting to be actually looking pretty good. Mitch never was crazy too much about racing. He just liked riding his motorcycle and out there having a good time. And you know what? I was good with that. But one thing there was always time for was a little instruction. Keep that form right and keep him safe. As he got older, he continued to ride a little now and then, but he had other interests rather than becoming a pro motocross rider. And then there's my oldest son, Shane, who never got a chance to really get involved in two wheels, but he and the family love going out to the desert and riding their four-wheelers and their side-by-side. Well, as my 10 years with Bull Taco were getting ready to come to an end, I got to race a lot of neat races, Talladega and Daytona. Heck, I even got to race the Houston Astrodome, which was a pretty cool thing, being able to lay out the track and race it. And then there was Daytona, huh, running through this banner. That was scary, kind of hitting it blind. And David and I, well, we got to go to Toronto and both of us raced. David made the main, I missed it by one, but it was still a lot of fun. Then there was the cool bull tacos that I built, all blue, kind of trying to play off of the Honda all red scheme. Well, good days with bull taco, but now it was time to make the change and head to Kawasaki. Yep, that's a little different. Me racing and David cheering me on. Well, it was 25 years since I beat the Europeans at Saddleback, and I said, well, before I quit racing, I want to try and win Loretta Lynn. So I entered the 50-plus class, and, and after taking second in the first moto, I got my act together and won the last two. So that was pretty cool, winning the 50-plus class at Loretta Lynn's. So what's the deal with the tux? My ad said improve your style, so I was definitely going with the improve your style. Then after spending 10 years with Kawasaki, I had an offer from Honda to switch over, and it only made sense because David was riding Hondas. And at the same time, I wrote a book entitled Gary Bailey Teaches Rider Technique. Of course, they were all the normal things in there from how to corner better and how to get better starts and who would have ever guessed and also how to do wheelies you know I love doing wheelies and David and I love doing wheelies so it was kind of a cool part of the book then there was always some other tricky things like how to climb this steep bank and David he decides he's going to jump across this I thought it was a bad idea but it worked out really well 
Man, how time flies. 55 years old here and still love riding my motorcycle any chance I get. 30 years of teaching my motocross schools, having an opportunity to ride on all the tracks that I've built just to kind of test them out. Not going to do what those guys are going to do when they hit it on race day. But, you know, I love to ride it. And, of course, I always got to show off a little more doing my wheelies. And then I got to ride the Elsinore Grand Prix several times, which was always a lot of fun out in California, through the hills, and always a good time when you headed down into the streets of town. Yep, just a lot of good times riding my motorcycle and shooting photos and showing off doing my wheelies. Once it's in your blood, I just guess you can't quit. Even at 65 years old, I still loved riding and doing my motocross schools and always showing off a little bit and challenging all the students to do some of the crazy things that I do and hoping that they're going to make it. You know, there was always the wheelies and the one-footed knack-knack going down the road, hanging on for dear life and trying to steer the bike around the turn. And then the old lazy boy, you don't want to do this too long because uh, it gets pretty sketchy trying to hold that thing straight. Not spending too much time these days out on the motocross track, but back to the wheelies. Love going riding out in the California desert. And nothing like a little water crossing to have a little fun. Just a lot of fun hanging out with the boys in all those years. And then the special award in remembrance of me beating the Europeans in 1969. A postgraduate degree you're looking for, the professor, Gary Bailey, is the man to see. And here at the Dunlop Tire Test Facility in Huntsville, Alabama, he's running future Jeff Emmings and Jeremy McGrath of all ages through his entire curriculum. Like most schools, classroom time alternates with track time. With Gary, though, the students never get off their bikes. They just shut the engines off to listen, then fire them up and run drills for what they've been told. And with the engines screaming, try to hear his words ringing in their ears. Here at the Dunlop track, it is hot, dry, and dusty, making for less than ideal working conditions. Even though it would be easier for the professor to stand in the shade sipping a cold drink while his students suffer, he's sweating it out at trackside, making sure everyone gets his full attention. I cherish the days when the track is perfect, it's had a little rain on it, and it's like, those days, I mean, boy, they catch me on one of those days, and I'm just like, you can't stop me, I'm ready to go all day long. This professor doesn't just lecture in great papers either. No sir, the man knows about that of which he speaks. Before you can say whoops five times, Bailey's through a section of them real fast and heading back to explain why. Don't rush it at first. Come in here and just get it timed. Uh, and try and be smooth and keep the power and keep the front end light. There's no mistaking the intensity that runs through a Gary Bailey school session. At times it resembles boot camp being run by the drill sergeant from hell. Would you tell this guy back here on number six on the KTM, okay? Would you tell him about this kind of clutch usage? Is that using your clutch? No. Huh? What's wrong with you letting your clutch out that fast? It'll, it'll pop the front up or uh, it'll spin. But you're never going to get a decent control power. Now, what you did, what you did to satisfy me, not to satisfy you, to satisfy me, so you didn't get smacked with a stick. You just finished telling me over here 10 minutes ago that if you feed the clutch out, that you won't wheelie and you won't get tire spin, and that you will build a stronger power. You just finished telling me that. You should already have this down just like 95% of these other guys do. This doesn't get it. It is not an explosion of the clutch. It's not the way it works. Bailey tells his recruits constantly remember that they came here to learn. I tell them straight up front, you're five, you're 50 years old, you ride a 50, you ride a 500, you come here to learn, I'm going to tell you, if you can't stand me getting in your face all day long, if you don't do it right, then get your money and leave because you're in the wrong place. The Gary Bailey School of Motocross is apparently the right place. The list of riders with whom Bailey's work reads like a who's who of the sport. Damon Bradshaw, Ryan Hughes, Greg Albertine, Jeff Stanton, just to name a few. 
when I do get to work with those guys, the fact that they come and ask me in the first place for my help, and then when I am able to make a change with a rider of that level, it's very satisfying because I go, these guys are at the top. And there are times when this teacher reminds us of the days when the Board of Education was a wooden paddle standing in the corner. And as soon as I bring out my stick, buddy, and I tell them I'm serious, and I go, look, you don't listen to what I'm telling you. I'm going to wrap you on the knuckles if you don't use the clutch. You know, they all figure out, man, they use the clutch just like that. All of a sudden now, everybody knows how to use the clutch and leave their finger on it. Why don't you use that thing? Why don't you use it? From the smallest rider on the smallest bike to big boys with big toys, Bailey tailors his instruction accordingly. And when one of them takes a little digger, there are plenty of dads around, including Gary, to get him going again. Then use the incident as a learning tool. This guy couldn't have got on the gas if he wanted to. If he would have built power, he would have been in trouble too. If he had a bell power, he launched the front end right off the jump because he was so far back. You got to get your head over the front end. Your head has to stay up here all the time, always up there. That's where your head has to be so that you can be aggressive with the power. If he got aggressive with the power going up that jump, that thing would have launched out from underneath him anyway. As it was, he just lost the front end. And so it goes, from right after breakfast until just before dinner. A whole lifetime of experience trying to squeeze through the funnel of a single day into the minds of young motocrossers with dreams of fame and glory. When the bell rings and school is dismissed, the students and parents alike have their turn grading the teacher. He taught me a lot. I'm going to have to uh, go home and practice on it. Uh, he, a lot of technique, skill. It was a real good class. The first lady needs to have a class with, with the parents more than he does with the students sometimes. The first school was uh, was the most eye-opening. And then now we just pick up the little things that we missed or, or fine-tune or change over the years, you know, styles change. For 30 years now, this pioneer-turned guru has been passing his seemingly endless wisdom on to an entire generation. And there's not even a hint that he's going to quit anytime soon. As long as youngsters want to learn, experienced riders want to get better, or even superstars need a minor adjustment, school will be in session somewhere. Reporting for Bike Week, I'm Ryan Drever. Well, working on 77 years old now, thought I'd give you a quick little look of my collection. Well, here we are. Let's take a quick look here at my shop and the way it looks now. Little taco that I just restored. Nice helmet collection. A few of my own personal helmets. Lots of memorabilia. A lot of memories hanging up on the wall. A lot of jerseys overhead. The 80 I used to race on flat track. My last 450. Corner, a lot of David's stuff over in the corner. That's my Kawasaki that I rode at Loretta Lynn's. Won the 50 plus class. My Greaves beating the Europeans. Riding gear that I wore back then. Custom bike that was made for David that I got at one of the auctions. Just great stuff and great memories everywhere you look. And then of course, everybody has to have their little beautiful street bike. Y'all have a blessed day and thank you for watching this video. A big thank you to everyone that has helped me in my days of racing and motocross schools. I'm not going to try to start with names because there are so many to thank that I don't want to forget anyone. With that said, I do want to thank my family and friends and a big thank you to my wife Diana for everything that she does for me every day. And most important, thank God for letting me have this life and success in the world of motorcycles. At age 77, it's good to still be here with pretty good health as many of my friends my age are gone. I also am blessed to have my three boys and their families here and safe. Yes, three. My oldest son, Shane, never had the opportunity to get into dirt bikes, but the family loves four-wheeling and side-by-sides. So at this time, 
I still have my mom at 94, brother Bob and sister Cindy, my three boys, my 10 grandkids, and my five great-great-grandkids, plus the next generation, my great-nephew Ryan Smith, and my great-great-niece Riley. Not sure if there are more coming, but for now, that's it. Life is good.